Thursday, the 18th of February, 1988, Rochester, Minnesota, the United States. A vibrant city nestled in southeast Minnesota in Olmsted County. It's ringed by gentle rolling hills and surrounded by farmland within a deciduous forest biome. Though, on that fateful Thursday in February of 1988, the peaceful nature that engulfed the city would bear witness to an evil unimaginable. People say Ted Bundy didn't show any emotion. I showed emotion. The following episode is not suitable for those under the age of 13. Viewer discretion and parental guidance is advised. Do you want more Josh Mouse content? Do you want to hang out with me live, play chill games and discuss true crime with me? Then guess what? You can. Just jump over to twitch.tv forward slash Josh Miles and hit that cheeky little follow button where I stream every Monday, Wednesday, Friday and Sundays at 9pm UK time. We hang out on stream whenever a new true crime video goes live where we'll talk about the case that's in the new video and just kind of hang out. It's like Joshua Miles after hours. Why? Follow me on Twitch. You can join our little community for free. You can find a link at the top of the description and in the pinned comments. Now, back to the case. David Francis Brom was born on the 3rd of October 1971 to parents Paulette and Bernard Brom in Cascade Township, Minnesota. He was the second born child of what would become a family of six, with his older brother Joseph Leonard Brom, known as Joe, being brought into the world on the 24th of June 1969. David's parents then welcomes their first daughter, Diane, on the 10th of April 1974, and then their third son, Richard, known as Ricky, on the 25th of July 1976. Now, not much information is publicly available about David's upbringing and early life, but what we do know was that he was a good student at high school. His attendance had been excellent, his grades were good, he was a B-plus student, and his relationship with the teachers were also positive. David's Spanish teacher would later describe David as being, quote, an above average student. He got B's in my class. He was pleasant, quiet, but we got along well. There had been no forewarning to the teachers at David's school, no signs, nothing that would have been indicative of what occurred on Thursday the 18th of February 1988. Though, in the years leading up to that Thursday in 1988, David's life behind closed doors had been a very different story. You see, David had been suffering from a progressive depression that, according to medical records, had emerged over a period of several years, and the deterioration of David's mental health had seen him develop suicidal ideations. His solution, however, to his declining mental state had been to try to be happy and try to think of ways he could make everybody else around him happy, and it was that solution that David came up with that essentially fooled everybody that had been around him. His friends and teachers at school saw him as the class clown, or a boy that was always jumping about and saying witty or entertaining things, though it was a very different case when David was at home. David attempted on his own life twice in 1987. The first time had occurred at the end of his ninth grade in June of 1987, and the second attempt had occurred towards the end of summer in September of that same year. David would later elaborate on these two attempts, both of which he hadn't told his parents about. The home that David lived in with his siblings and his parents had been located near a forest area, and following the end of his ninth grade year in June of 1987, at the age of 16, he attempted to hang himself from a tree, though he changed his mind at the last minute. Towards the end of the preceding summer, David claimed to have overdosed on four to five sleeping pills, which he had obtained from a girl he knew that had been taking them for a sleeping disorder. David, following taking the sleeping pills, ended up falling very sick and threw up. 
He told his parents that he had the flu at the time and they believed him. David had been very serious at the time about ending his life during the second attempt and would later state that he was very disappointed in the outcome. The root of David's depression, the reason that he had found himself drawn to suicidal ideation at such a young age, had been due to a difficult relationship between himself and his family. In particular, his relationship with his father, Bernard. And these issues between David and his family only grew exponentially worse following his parents evicting his older brother Joe from the family home. You see, Joe had begun to dress in a punk style, which both of their parents heavily disagreed with. And so, after many arguments about Joe's punk style, his parents kicked him out of the home. David's parents, Bernard and Paulette, then imposed an even stricter form of discipline and even stricter rules on David and his younger siblings, following Joe being kicked out in what appeared to be an attempt to prevent the lifestyle that had overtaken their eldest son occurring to their other children. David's family had been of a middle-class background and were financially comfortable. They were respected within their local community and both of David's parents shunned any lifestyle or ideology that tarnished their reputation. They imposed a very strict curfew, ordered David and his siblings to undertake household chores and would punish them, allegedly, for failure to comply. Now this hasn't actually been confirmed and it is the only testimony of this punishment occurring, so don't take the following as gospel. Now it was alleged that David's parents would hit him and his siblings and ground them if they failed to complete their household chores promptly or satisfactorily. And David wanted to please his father. He sought that validation, but found it impossible to achieve. One clinician would later state, quote, Events which happened to him, while unpleasant, had become greatly magnified in his own thinking. They had become overwhelming and seen as impossible to deal with. Hence, he described episodes where his father would slap him, usually only once at a time, although on rare occasions two or three times in succession, and with an open hand. David never described his father hitting him with a fist, nor ever receiving any beatings. Yet to David, the nature of the anticipation of being slapped in such a manner by his father was experienced as something he came to dread. It was experienced as one of the things he could not deal with, and from which he needed desperately to escape. On these occasions, he would feel terrified. The striking thing is David's overreaction and sensitivity, his inability to deal with his father, and the persistent fear which did not leave. David felt that he was unable to talk to his father about his feelings, and even stated that he and his father never really spoke to one another at all. And we know that throughout his high school career, David had continued to put on this facade of happiness and that everything was going okay with him. He didn't seek any help from any other adults, and this is speculated to be largely due to the fact that his parents had this massive respect in the local community and he didn't want to tarnish that, and he didn't think that any adults would pay attention to him because of this respect. You see, David's father, Bernard, had been an engineer at the local IBM plant, and his mother, Paulette, had run a preschool program at their local church, though she had quit a couple of years prior to 1988 so that she could spend more time with her kids. She was known in the community for being good at sewing and the creative type. The entire family, bar Joe, would attend Mass every single Sunday without fail at Pax Christi Catholic Church, which was where both of David's parents were parish leaders and were very involved in the ongoings at the church. They even hosted several meetings at the family home, and David's father Bernard used his home computer almost exclusively for the parish and the church. The entire family was well respected and seen, at least from the outside, as a beautiful family that were examples to all. The local pastor would later describe David's parents as, quote, leaders of the church and very well respected. There was not a clue that something was wrong claims a neighbour to the family. Throughout all of this, David believed that no adult would understand or respect the seriousness of the problems that he'd been silently facing. And the method in which he continued to keep up this facade of being happy to the people around him only made his mental health worse. And along with these thoughts of suicide, a dark seed began to grow at the back of David's mind. A seed that would soon grow and take over his mind with thoughts of murdering his family. Now, David never directly shared these thoughts and ideas with his friends, 
though he did share them indirectly through a fantasy he had about a trip to Florida. He had told one of his friends that in the summer of 1988, he wanted to take a van and go to Florida, and in Florida, David said that he wanted to kill his parents. This friend of David would later go on to say that David had told him that he wanted to take a couple of girls with him on this trip, but hadn't told him who, but he had told him that he wanted to kill them too. This friend didn't believe a word David was saying at the time, and just kind of shrugged it off as a sick joke, not something that could possibly be serious. In another version of this fantasy, David would kill his family, steal the family van and money before driving to Florida, where he and two of his friends would live it up until they ran out of money, and then David would end his life. A classmate of David's would later state, quote, a friend and me and Dave, we had a sort of vacation planned, which seems more like a story, that we would add things into it to make it more exciting, add into the plot, like saying an ongoing story, but not written, just the conversation piece that we would have. It involved me, Angie and Dave going to Florida this summer and how we would live off the money we would have and just get an apartment and have fun. We had to get a car and to get down there and he said that the way we could do that was for him to get rid of his parents so that we could have the car. He would kill his family and call into IBM and tell them that there had been a death in the family and so Mr. Brom would be taking off a few weeks, and so therefore, no one would be looking for him. I just thought it was a way to make the plot more exciting in our conversations. Like saying, when I grow up, I want to do this. Just making a storyline and making everything more dramatic. But it wasn't like a big plan. It wasn't planned to happen February 18th. The whole thing was to pretty much live it up before, and Dave said he wanted to die, and me and Angie didn't want to die. Just when we talked to each other, we always said, when he does that, we'll just leave because we didn't want that. But it was still part of the story for me and Angie. Little did David's classmates know, this fantasy, this hypothetical story, would be violently pulled into reality. In the evening of Wednesday the 17th of February 1988, at about 11.30pm, David had been hanging out in his bedroom when his father had walked in and started threatening him. You see, David had, over the prior months, become more invested in the punk and heavy metal scene and had amassed a large collection of heavy metal music. And it was this heavy metal music collection that David's father had threatened to take away from him if he didn't change his attitude. Whether this meant the lifestyle that David was delving into, the same lifestyle that his parents had kicked out his older brother Joe for, or whether there had been another incident regarding David's attitude earlier in that day, it is unclear, though we do know that during this heated conversation, Bernard, David's father, actually pushed David who fell backwards onto a table. A deep fear overcame David, who was petrified he would be struck again by his father, and so he fled the room. At some points between 1.30am and 3am in the early hours of Thursday the 18th of February 1988, David placed a call to one of the friends that he had spoken to about the Florida trip, and asked her whether she would skip school the following day if he were to murder his parents that night. There isn't much information available about the exact details of that phone call, and only a few sources actually mention it occurring, though I thought it important within the timeline of this case to mention. Following this call, David returned to his bedroom and began listening to music again. This happened within that same 1.30am to 3am timeframe, and during that time, David thought heavily about the situation he was in and how he was feeling. He weighed up all the consequences before finalising his plans. At about 3am that Thursday, David left his bedroom and headed towards the garage, tiptoeing through the family home, careful not to cause any noise that might see his family stir from their sleep. When David reached the garage, he carefully picked up a long-handled axe. At some points, he had also picked up a steak knife, and armed with both, he went into the room where both his parents had been peacefully sleeping. The events that followed are difficult to fully ascertain. David claims to have not remembered hitting anyone, but he did remember screaming. Lots of screaming. Not just from his victims, but also from himself. He screams and cried. According to the psychiatric evaluation reports that would later be conducted, quote, David recalled going to his parents' bedroom and opening the door. Their lights were out, and he recalled standing in the doorway with the axe. When I think about it, I get kind of sick. What I remember is gross. 
I walk into my parents' room and they are asleep. I have the axe. There is a lot of screaming in there. I am screaming and they are. I was scared. I don't remember hitting anyone. I could hear the screaming though and it went on and on. Then I remember being in my room and packing things like blankets. All the lights were on and I had to go into each room. My brother was in his bedroom and my mother and sister in the hall and there was blood everywhere. I asked specifically if he could remember hitting anyone with the axe and he could not, nor could he remember entering any of the rooms specifically, but he remembered vividly hearing the constant screaming. The screaming was not only that of the victims, but he remembers himself screaming and believes he was crying at the time as well. He does not know why he was screaming, but he remembered it was not particularly any words, although he remembered screaming at the top of his voice. David Brom called a friend immediately after the slaying and confided the events to her. She reported the conversation at the later waiver hearing that took place. Quote, he went into his parents' room and his mum started screaming and he went over to his dad and hit him in the head and knocked him over. And his dad tried to get up and so he hit him again with an axe. And he said that he had hit his dad several times because his dad kept trying to get up. And he walked out of the room and he didn't tell me what order after that, but he said that he got his mum and when he went into Rick's room, Rick screamed and so Dave screamed back and he didn't say anything about hitting Rick. And he went out into the hall again and Diane was standing over her mum, just staring, and Diane screamed and so Dave again screamed back and he didn't say anything about hitting Diane. In just a matter of moments, David had murdered his father, Bernard Brom, who had been 41 years old, his mother, Paulette Brom, who had also been 41 years old, his little brother, Richard, known as Ricky, who had been 11 years old, and his little sister, Diane, who had been 13 years old. The coroner's report detailed the severity of the injuries that they had sustained. Bernard Brom had sustained 22 axe wounds. Paulette had sustained 19 axe wounds. Diane had been struck eight times with the axe and Ricky had been hit nine times. David had left the axe, the murder weapon, near the bottom of the basement stairs as he packed up his things. He would later speak of how he was packing a duffel bag in his bedroom and as he was doing so, he could hear the sound of dripping blood. The carnage that had occurred in the Brom family home, the horror, the pain, it's unimaginable. At about 3.30 a.m., shortly after committing the murders, David tried to phone a friend, but hung up as his friend's father had answered the phone. At some point afterwards, David took the family's van and drove it to a local bank where he withdrew money using his mother's bank card. He then drove to a local supermarket where he purchased some cigarettes and snacks. Following this, David drove to a spot which overlooked his friend's house so that he could see when she left for school in the morning. Then as the morning came, David caught up to his friend as she was headed to school and he asked her to skip school with him that day, which wasn't an unusual request. The friend would later testify, quote, I said, so are we skipping school? And he said, yeah, you need a break. And so I was happy and thinking that, okay, sure, whatever. I asked him if he had the car today and he said, yeah. And I said, why did you have to work? Because usually when he worked, he got to drive the car to school and he said, no, I can get anything I want now. My parents are dead. I didn't know if this was a way to make the cutting school more exciting, if we were going to add something into the story and make it exciting. And I said, so you did it? And he said, yep. And that's when we reached the car, the van. David and his friends then drove to a nearby park where they hung out for a short while before driving to the bank where David withdrew more money. They then drove over to the friend's house where David's friend tried to shave the sides of David's head. The hair shaving didn't go well, so they decided to go over to a Kmart to purchase a razor, and when they got back to the friend's house, David's friend finished the punk haircut on David that he wanted. Quote, he wanted the sides taken off and a design in the back with lines. Shortly after this, David's friend's mother unexpectedly returned home, which saw David having to hide in his friend's closet until she left again. David's friend then returned to high school, and so David decided to drive over to a different high school where he met up with some other friends for lunch. During this lunch, he got one of the friends that he'd met to dye his hair. The first attempt at dyeing his hair failed, so David went back to his own family home to try to dye his hair again. Bear in mind, in his family home was still the remains of his family, the people he had butchered and murdered and killed. He was just dyeing his hair downstairs. At some point after this, David met up with a different friend to return a book bag and he told this friend that he was in deep trouble. David then told this friend that he was planning to sleep under a bridge that night and then walk to the Twin Cities in the morning. 
At 5.23 p.m., neighbours to the Brom family placed a call to the authorities, expressing concern for the family. A welfare check was then requested and two deputies were dispatched to the family home. The police arrived shortly before 6 p.m. The officers found the front door to the family home to have been closed, but not locked, and so they cautiously entered the property, calling out to the silence that had engulfed the once lively home. As they traversed the stairs to the second floor, they were confronted with a gruesome scene. The Brom family lay slaughtered before them, all but the eldest son, Joe, and David. A quick examination of the bodies revealed that they had been in a state of rigor mortis that indicated they had been deceased for longer than 12 hours. Subsequently, the authorities issued a nationwide alert for David. The authorities tracked down Joe Brom, the eldest sibling, who had been working as a cook at a local restaurant, and they informed Joe of his family's deaths. But David remained unaccounted for. Let's take a listen to an account described by one of Diane's friends regarding the day that Diane and the Brom family were murdered. I grew up with the Brom family. My parents were super good friends with the Brom parents, and my dad works with their dad. And I was best friends from probably age two with Diane. Um, and the murders happened when we were both in eighth grade at St. Pius. I'll tell you, I'll tell you kind of how it unfolded. I was actually at their house for a sleepover the Saturday before. Um, and Diane, uh, Diane's desk was in our, we had four desks in our, in our homeroom pushed together. On Thursday of that week, she did not show up for school. Um, and there was some concern, um, that, you know, the parents didn't call in, um, Rick, her fifth grade brother was not, not at school either. Mm -hmm. And that was just kind of unusual for, um, for kids to be missing without their parents calling in. Mrs. Brown was a stay-at-home mom, right. um, and, uh, didn't think much of it. Um, but then went, went about our day as usual and, um, my mom was a, our eighth grade math teacher. So um, I remember laying in our living room at night and I was, my dad and I were both laying on our stomachs doing um, my algebra together because my mom refused to help me with my math homework. And uh, a phone call came in and it was after eight. And back then in 88, that was not normal to get it, to have the phone ring after eight o'clock right. at night. And my mom got on the phone and just, my mom never cried and she just started wailing. Um, like it was really unusual. And I remember just my body stiffening because that was so unusual. And, and she hung up the phone and came in and she just couldn't get words out at first. And she said, you're good, Patty, you're gonna die. You're gonna, I don't know how to tell you this, um, but, but Diane's dead. And <laughs> my body went from being stiff to being stiffer. Um, and my dad's body completely stiffened around me as well. Um, and from that moment forward, it was like uh, a dark cloud had surrounded me and I couldn't move. Um, and I did move. I got up. Um, my oldest sister, my only sister at home at the time was a senior in high school. And so, um, and my grandma lived with us at the time too. So I, all I remember about the rest of that night is we had, we found out the whole family was found murdered. Um, mm -hmm. David was missing. David was like an older brother to me. And, uh, you know, he had just been cross country skiing with Diane and I on, in their backyard the Sunday before and, um, super nice kid. And, we ended up sitting around and saying the rosary. And then we woke up the next morning and went to school. And walking into St. Pius was just like, it was so surreal. It was like ghost town. Everyone was quiet. Everyone was there. I walked by Ricky's fifth grade classroom first. And just, I remember seeing people, but not hearing anything. David was actually sighted by one of his teachers at a local shopping centre that evening and the family's van that David had been driving was found by the authorities at about 11pm that evening near a Methodist hospital. David actually spent the night of that Thursday in a culvert near his home 
and it wouldn't be until the following day that David would be apprehended by the authorities. At about 8.30 a.m. on Friday the 19th of February 1988, a citizen witnessed David using a payphone at a post office and reported him to the police. He was then arrested inside the post office and brought in for questioning. Good evening. Topping tonight's News 11, police charge a 16-year-old boy with four counts of first-degree murder after his family is found axed to death in their Rochester home. Tonight, there are more questions than answers as police search for a motive. Police arrested David Brom this morning after they caught up with him at a town post office. He offered no resistance. In court today, Brom listened passively to the charges against him. Now the question is whether to try him as an adult or juvenile. The ordeal happened yesterday in a suburb on the outskirts of Rochester, and the whole town is in shock. We have a team report tonight, beginning with Alan Costantini. It was Thursday night when Olmstead County Sheriff's deputies found the bodies of four members of the Brom family in their Cascade, Minnesota home. Bernard and Paulette Brom and two of their children, 14-year-old Diane and 9-year-old Rick, had been murdered with an axe. Today, Olmstead County authorities charged 16-year-old David Brom with four counts of first-degree murder. First degree because they have witnesses who say the high school sophomore planned the killings of his family. I think there were two subjects mentioned in the complaint indicating that he talked about the, the killing his parents or that he had killed them and his brother and sister. Still, authorities say they have no motive and mental tests have been ordered. We're asking that there be a psychiatric evaluation, yes. And we're meeting with the judge on Monday afternoon to discuss uh, who might do that and obtain that order. The defense is joining in that request. The question Olmstead County authorities must decide now is whether to charge David Brom as a juvenile or as an adult. As a juvenile, if convicted, he would face less than three years in confinement. As an adult, he could get life. All of Rochester is in shock over the killings. John Stone has that story. If you will, Lord. These are David Brahms, Lourdes High School classmates, praying at a special mass at St. John's Church, sharing one student's bewilderment that her classmate is suspected of murder. I feel sorry for everyone, and I basically think that everyone just hurts. Well, this is obviously the shock phase. Uh, it's beginning to set in. Uh, there is, in several cases, uh, extreme grief. The shock has spread well beyond Lourdes High School, beyond St. Pius Elementary, where David's brother and sister went to school before they were killed. All of Rochester is in disbelief. It's just, you know, a shock to the whole community. Everyone's talking about it, wondering why. David is described as well-behaved and polite, the boy who'd shovel his neighbor's snow for free, who'd sit in the front row of Father Jack Krogh's religion class. David uh, appeared to be happy, interested. Uh, Lourdes High and St. Pius School remained open today, but much of the community went to church, where clergy helped them deal with the murders. But Lourdes Principal Leahy says at his school, that process could take months. John Stone, News 11, Rochester. Due to David being 16 years old at the time of his arrest, he was actually initially charged in the juvenile justice system. Though after the hearing, he was referred to be prosecuted as an adult. 63 potential jurors were ultimately interviewed for the trial against David, each of which were questioned by counsel on the influence the media coverage has had on their pretrial impressions and opinions of the case. All of the potential jurors acknowledged some awareness of the press coverage that David's case had received, and several actually admitted predetermined opinions on whether David was guilty or not. It was an understandably difficult task of sorting through the potential jurors to ensure a fair trial, though the defense and the state managed to settle on a group of jurors suitable for the trial to go ahead. The trial against David had to be conducted in two phases as required by Minnesota law due to the fact that David had pleaded both not guilty and not guilty by reason of mental illness to the charges brought against him. Quotes, the first phase within the trial was limited to a determination of whether David was guilty of first or second degree murder in connection to the deaths of his parents and siblings. During phase one, defense counsel made an offer of proof requesting permission to introduce expert psychiatric testimony regarding David's capacity to premeditate his actions. The trial court denied this request and the defense rested without offering testimony. 
the jury was instructed that it should not consider evidence of David's mental illness in its phase one deliberations and found David guilty of four counts of murder in the first degree. In phase two of his trial, David bore the burden of proving his legal mental illness by a preponderance of the evidence. The defense presented expert testimony from one psychiatrist who concluded that David did not understand that killing his parents and siblings was wrong when he did so, and that therefore he was legally insane. The state offered expert testimony from four psychiatrists. Of these four witnesses, two concluded that David was not legally insane at the time he committed the murders, and two did not offer an opinion as to his legal mental illness. All the experts agreed, however, that David suffered some form of mental illness or impairment. The psychiatrist who testified for the prosecution conceded in his expert testimony that David had been mentally ill and had killed his family to keep from killing himself. David's only surviving family member, his older brother Joe, had an alibi that checked out for the day that the Brom family was murdered, and forensics had managed to lift palm prints from the murder weapon that matched the palm prints of David. After 21 hours of deliberation, a jury convicted David Brom as guilty on all four murder counts. He was subsequently sentenced to three consecutive life sentences. David Brom must serve at least 52 years in prison before he will be eligible for parole. But that wasn't all that occurred in the trial. In fact, the prosecution decided to investigate a link most bizarre. Good evening. Topping Nightcast, a possible link between murder and music. Music performed by a rock group right here in the Bay Area. Four members of a Midwestern family were murdered. The 16-year-old son is the prime suspect. Members of the experimental rock group Negative Land have been drawn into the case. And prosecutors won't even tell them for certain that their music, how their music might be involved. Hal Eisner has our report. It was the kind of murder case that friends and neighbors said didn't make sense. They didn't understand how an A student from a good family could murder his brother, sister, and parents with an axe. He was not a homicidal maniac. He, he was did not show he was, any yeah. signs of he wanting surprised. to hurt anyone. David Brom was accused in the multiple axe slayings, but now almost three months later, many are still wondering why. One explanation may involve a Bay Area music group called Negative Land. <laughs> Negative Land's music is highly critical of the mass media, nuclear war, and handguns. The group thinks their music is humorous, but they don't find it a bit funny that one of their songs poking fun of religion may have sparked a dispute among the Brahms, triggering the murders. They say federal authorities asked them to cancel a long-planned 17-city tour and eliminate live performances until the conclusion of the investigation. The probe apparently involved their song, Christianity is Stupid. It's hard to listen to the cut and not laugh. If you have any sense of humor at all or, or uh, whatever, it's, it's, it's hard not to see the humor in it. And that it would result in anything as serious as this, I think is ridiculous. This isn't the first time controversial music has been linked to tragedy. Charles Manson said his murder spree was influenced by the Beatles' Helder Skelter. It's believed Night Stalker suspect Richard Ramirez was influenced by ACDC's Highway to Hell album. And Ozzy Osbourne's song Suicide Solution became the focal point of an actual suicide case involving a Southern California teenager. What you can say is that music is, is a bystander uh, involved to a certain degree, but most unlikely that it generated the mayhem. If it did, there'd be a lot more mayhem around. Meanwhile, the members of Negative Land are hoping for a speedy conclusion to the Brom case in Minnesota and eventually a return to their live performances and a career that after nine years had finally taken some positive turns. Joseph Leonard Brom, David's older brother and the only surviving member of the Brom family who wasn't incarcerated, would go on to receive a Bachelor of Science from Towson State University in 1995 with majors in philosophy and economics and a minor in art. 
1998, Joe received a master's in philosophy from Duquesne University, Pittsburgh, and then a master's of business administration from the Waynesburg College. He worked as an assistant professor of economics and philosophy at Eastern Gateway Community College for 15 years. In 1999, he married a woman called Stephanie, though they later divorced. Joe was known for being an avid cyclist and a massive enjoyer of the outdoors. In fact, he had actually hiked the Appalachian Trail from Georgia to Maine in 1995. Heartbreakingly, at the age of 46, on the 5th of January 2016, Joe passed away from cancer in Wintersville, Ohio. He survived by his girlfriend Jessica and his family, who all absolutely adored him. David Brom remains incarcerated at MCF Stillwater, where I hope, sincerely, that he rots behind bars till the end of his days. And that's everything that I have for you in today's video. Make sure you hit that subscribe button and click that bell icon so you can be notified every single time I post a brand new true crime video just like this one. Don't forget to go check out my Twitch. You can find a link at the top of the description. I'll be live right now when this video goes live. Um, so come and say hi, come say hi in the chat. Um, I'll be answering your questions about this case. I'm talking about this case and just vibing and just hanging out. So if you wanna come say hi, come say hi. You can find a link at the top of the description. You can also find my Twitter and Instagram. Both of my handles on those platforms are at it's Joshua Miles down below. And with all that being said, I'll see you in the next case. Do you want more Joshua Miles content? Do you want to hang out with me live, play chill games and discuss true crime with me? Then guess what? You can. Just jump over to twitch.tv forward slash Josh Miles and hit that cheeky little follow button where I stream every Monday, Wednesday, Friday and Sundays at 9pm UK time. We hang out on stream whenever a new true crime video goes live where we'll talk about the case that's in the new video and just kind of hang out. It's like Joshua Miles after hours. Why? Follow me on Twitch, you can join our little community for free. You can find a link at the top of the description and in the pinned comments. Now, back to the case. A special thank you to all of my Patreon members for helping keep this channel afloat, but especially thank you to my lead investigators for all of your support. If you'd like to support this channel for less than $5 a month, then head on over to patreon.com forward slash it's Joshua Miles. For less than $5 a month, you'll get early access to videos and access to scripts and also polls on cases. If you or someone you know has been affected by issues covered in our programming, including this episode, then please use the link in the description for information, advice and support.